Over the course of the first 27 video lectures, one of the major themes that ran through many of them was that from the very beginning of American history, the United States was not very united, particularly the North and the South. Of course, the main issue was the issue of slavery. The Constitutional Convention put off the question of slavery by adopting a number of compromises. However, as the country continued to grow and spread westward throughout the 1800s, the debate over slavery was reignited because it had to be decided whether or not slavery would be allowed to grow. Throughout the 1850s, a series of failed compromises over the spread of slavery only served to increase tensions. In today's video lecture, we will focus on four of the major milestones that ultimately led to the Civil War. We begin with the Missouri Compromise of 1820. When the Missouri Territory applied for statehood, the proposed state constitution allowed slavery. At that time, there was an even balance of slave states and free states. Adding Missouri as a state would upset that balance, which was important because remember, each state is allowed representation in the federal Congress. Northern states opposed Missouri being added as a slave state, and southern states opposed it being added as a free state. To resolve the issue, Representative Henry Clay from Kentucky proposed what became known as the Missouri Compromise. The Compromise added Missouri as a slave state, but to maintain the even balance, Maine, which at that time was part of the state of Massachusetts, was created as a free state. Lastly, it was agreed that no more slave states would be added north of the 36 degree 30 line of latitude with the exception of Missouri. Many viewed the Missouri Compromise as only a temporary fix. Thomas Jefferson referred to it as a fire bell in the night, meaning that the Missouri Compromise sounded an alarm for a conflict to come. An important thing to remember about the Missouri Compromise was that it only applied to U.S. territory, which at that time did not include the territory that we would acquire after the Mexican-American War. And that brings us to the next major milestone on the road to the Civil War, the Compromise of 1850. After the Mexican-American War, California, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico became U.S. territory. And once again, the question of whether or not slavery would be allowed in those territories was raised. The earlier Missouri Compromise did not apply to these new territories. So once again, a compromise was proposed, and again, it was Henry Clay, now a senator, who came up with it. There were four main components of the Compromise of 1850. First, California was added as a free state. Secondly, the slave question would be settled by popular sovereignty in the territories of Utah and New Mexico. In other words, those territories would hold a public referendum on the issue and let the people there vote. Put another way, it opened those territories to slavery. Thirdly, the slave trade, but not slavery itself, would be banned in the nation's capital. The last part of the Compromise of 1850 was the most controversial, and that was the adoption of a stronger fugitive slave law, which would assist slave owners in capturing runaway slaves. The Fugitive Slave Act was very biased in favor of southern slave owners. The law required that Northerners assist slave catchers and report suspected runaways. If Northerners did not cooperate, they were in violation of the law. And any African American in the North, free or not, was in danger of being captured and brought before a special judge. And if captured, it was very difficult to prove their innocence. Again, this compromise, rather than resolving the issue, only inflamed the tensions even further. Next on the list of incidents that increased tensions between the North and the South was the 1853 publication of the anti-slavery novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Spoiler alert here, the story's hero, a slave named Tom, is killed by a sadistic overseer named Simon Legree. The book became a bestseller and was reenacted in plays throughout the country. Abolitionists in the North hailed the book as an honest description of the brutality and inhumanity of slavery. Throughout the South, the book was viewed as a lie. They argued that Harriet Beecher Stowe depicted the South unfairly and had no basis for commenting on something she knew nothing about. Many states throughout the South refused to sell it. Upon meeting Harriet Beecher Stowe in 1862, 
Abraham Lincoln commented, so you're the little lady who wrote the book that started this great war. And finally, for this video lecture anyway, we have the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. In 1854, Kansas was the next territory to apply for statehood. Even though Kansas was above the Missouri Compromise Line, they wanted to be a slave state. After heated debate, Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which would allow popular sovereignty to decide. In other words, a public referendum, again, would be held in which the people of Kansas and Nebraska could vote on whether or not they would be a slave state. Put another way, the Kansas-Nebraska Act overturned the earlier Missouri Compromise by now allowing slavery to exist north of the 36 degree 30 line. What happened next was chaos. Both abolitionists armed with rifles and pro-slavery border ruffians from Missouri flooded into Kansas intent on swaying the referendum. Violence between the two groups soon broke out and Kansas was nicknamed Bleeding Kansas. By the time the violence ended in 1859, over 50 had died as a result. In many ways, what happened in Kansas would be a small precursor to what would take place in the near future. Today's video lecture is only part one of the road to the Civil War. In the next lecture, we will discuss three more important events that led to the secession of the southern states. So until then, have a great day.